The express from Dover was still coming to a stop when Hilary Drummond leapt onto the platform. He staggered a moment, coming close to falling, but righted himself, balanced like a tightrope walker with a suitcase in one hand and a satchel in the other. Once assured of his footing, he began to sprint along the platform at Charing Cross Station, heedless of the scores of men and women judging him for his lack of decorum. Drummond cared not a whit for their scandalized glances. After all, no one was trying to kill any of them. Way out, the sign said on the wall of the underground. Drummond felt relieved. He'd been looking for a way out since the ferry at Calais. He stumbled on the third step of the staircase leading to the street level and looked back over his shoulder. There were no blue coats in sight, not yet anyway, but he knew better than to think he had outrun his pursuers. Did he have time to do the one thing he had to do? Perhaps he could lose himself in the vast cavern that was Charing Cross Station. He passed the familiar green kiosk of a W. H. Smith's, and it made him glad he was in London again. He longed to look up at Admiral Nelson perched above Trafalgar Square. He'd lost his taste for Wienerschnitzel and goulash. If he survived, he'd stop at the Red Lion, glut himself on roast beef and put, and drink himself senseless. It seemed a proper reward for six months' labor. Drummond looked over his shoulder again. There was still no sign that anyone was following him, so he darted into the public toilet. It was a gamble, since there was only one entrance. He could not hide in such a public place, because this group had no compunction about being seen. Death provides its own anonymity. Ten minutes later he came out into Charing Cross Road. Nearby, the bell, known as Big Ben, began to play its preamble. When it tolled, he counted the peals. It was just after nine in the morning. What day was it? Tuesday, he thought, or perhaps Wednesday. London was in his nostrils. It was a reek, but it was a good reek, a familiar one. It was coal and soot and steam engines, horse sweat and night soil. Whitehall was just ahead. He could see it. Then he noticed a man with a blue coat at the corner. No, not a man, a youth. Drummond wasn't certain whether he had been spotted or not, but he did not take the chance. He ducked through the nearest door for safety. He was in a public house, by all appearances. The wood was ancient and grey, the smell of the room hoppy. Patrons and even the publican himself looked at him without interest. He stayed just long enough to doff his coat and hang it on a hook before stepping out a second door. The youth had passed by. With nerveless fingers he pulled a cigarette from his case. Before he could pull a box from his pocket, a hand came forward with a match.